Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to uh, this meeting of the planning committee taking place from the Walton Suite in the Winchester Guildhall. Time is 9.30. My name is Councillor Jane Rutter. I'm the vice chair of the planning committee and I'm taking the chair for this meeting. I just have a few housekeeping points to make before we begin. Please can I advise you that this meeting is being audio recorded and live streamed from the Council's website. In addition, a video recording of the meeting will be uploaded to the Council's YouTube channel after the meeting. For those in the room, please can I ask that you speak clearly and to keep the microphone quite close and directly in front of you when speaking. Please can I remind any officers or members joining virtually to turn off their cameras and mute their microphones. I'd like to welcome the members of the public joining us today. Please can I direct you to the handout you were provided with for further information and guidance about the meeting. Please also note the information should the fire alarm sound. If you're speaking today, when we get to your item on the agenda, I will ask each of you in turn to come forward to the empty desk in front of you. The microphone is activated by pressing the large button on the base and a timer will appear on the screen to show the time remaining. It won't start counting down until you start to make your presentation. With us today to assist with our decision making, we have Lorna Hutchings, who's our planning delivery and implementation manager, Fiona Sutherland, who is our public law manager, and for each application, we will be joined by the case officer who for the first two applications is Cameron Taylor. Firstly, can I please everyone to ensure that mobile phones and any other electronic devices that might be bleeping at us um, are on silent or switched off entirely. Before we turn to the agenda formally, um, we need to elect a vice chair for this meeting. And I would like to nominate Councillor Angela Clear. Do I have a seconder for that proposal? Yes, a second that, Chair. Thank you, Councillor West. Are there any other nominations? Thank you very much. Councillor Clear, would you like to come and join me up here? Thank you. And we move to the agenda. Procedural items, De apologies and deputy members. Matthew, do we have any apologies? Uh, morning, members. Um, we have one apology from Councillor Evans, who's being replaced by Councillor Small for this meeting. Apart from that, all members of the committee are present. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, OK, disclosures of interest. Are there any disclosures of interest from members or officers in matters to be discussed? Councillor Laming. Yes, I shall be withdrawing for the first item as I shall be speaking. Thank you very much. Would you like to go and join the public now? Thank you. Oh, well, we'll just do the minutes, shall we? Let's do the minutes, yes. OK. The minutes of the previous meeting. Can I ask members if those are agreed? Agreed. Thank you very much. OK, now you can move, Councillor Lamy. Thank you. OK, where appropriate to accept the update sheet um, as an addendum to the report? Is that agreed, members? Okay, we now move on to the planning applications. So the first one is referred to as item number six on the agenda. It's reference number 220021 FUL and it's 119 Maytree Close Badger Farm. And the officer presenting is Cameron Taylor. So if you'd like to give us your presentation. Thank you, Cam. Thank you very much, Chair. So this this presentation is for retrospective planning approval for a fence at 119 Maytree Close in Badger Farm. We have the location plan in which we can see the scale of the site in relation to the wider area, along with additional sort of land which has been retained outside the boundary of the property between the road itself. Followed by an aerial photograph of the site marked by the yellow triangle, in which we see the residential nature of Maytree Close in the area. Followed by an estates map with the sections marked in green as under ownership of number 119 itself. Next, you have a view looking towards Maytree Close from Meadow Way, 
in which 119 is situated in the left-hand side of the photo, number one located to the right, followed by a Google Street View, which is showing the area pre prior to the erection of the fence, <coughs> looking from May May Meadow Way, with the property directly in front, directly center in the photo. Here we have a photo which is showing the opposite side, looking towards number one, May Tree Close itself. Followed by a photo as you enter May Tree Close, looking directly towards fencing and the property itself, number 119. Next, we have a photo which shows where the fence ends, with the principal elevation of the dwelling sitting in the right hand side of the photo, which I'm surfing with the mouse. Followed by a photo looking down, looking from Major Close towards Meadow Way, with the property now on the right hand side of that photo. Followed by the Google Street View from within Major Close, looking towards the property and back towards Meadow Way. We have a photo a few meters back from the junction between Major Close and Meadow Way itself, looking up towards the roundabout towards which uh, is the access towards the Sainsbury's and Badger Farm. Followed by a photo from Meadow Way itself, looking towards Major Close with that said roundabout situated behind in the photo. Next, we have a photo which is from within Major Close, which is looking towards the access, then leads to the junction between Major Close and Meadow Way itself. End of the fencing. That, conclu that concludes my presentation with the officer's approval for the officer's recommendation B for approval. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cameron. Okay, we now move to public speaking. Um, we have a parish council representative, Councillor John Godbold. Would you like to come forward, John? You have three minutes. No hurry when you're ready. No hurry, just take your time. Good morning, all. My name is John Godbold. I'm chairman of the Badger, of Badger Farm Parish Council. Parish Council feel that the enclosed land is in fact open space and has been ever since this part of the development was built in the 70s. This land, as such, has been managed by WCC throughout as open space. This property was subject to an application to build an additional three bed property in 2014. Fortunately, the planners at the time refused this application. One reason for the refusal was that it wasn't in keeping with the original design concept of Badger Farm. We feel that the latest application should be refused on the same grounds. This application would also make this house number 119 the only one to have a two metre front garden fence which is, goes against the open plan nature of Badger Farm. TC also feel that the enclosure of open space will set a precedent right across the estate. Since Winchester City Council failed in its duty to protect a lot of our open spaces in the 70s and 80s, we feel that it is now up to the present council and parish to protect the original design concept. When Badger Farm was originally designed, the right to permitted development was withdrawn the fact that we jealously guard and try to maintain the open feel of Badger Farm, the estate. I feel some of the pictures that were shown up there don't really um, show the sight lines that are affected, driving a vehicle as they weren't taken from a vehicle. But I feel that the pictures were actually giving a false impression of um, sight lines that have been affected. And that is my... Thank you. If you'd like to just wait and see if any members have any questions for you. Councillor Reid. Thank you, Chairman. Um, John, during your presentation, you said you thought it was open space. Where did you get that assumption from? Who managed it? It was managed by Winchester City Council. A lot of the spaces on Badger Farm are down as open space. Um, in fact, they were, ne were never actually um, taken over by the city. The area, for example, um, Davis Kick around area, 
that's subsequently been sold because the city didn't actually protect it. The other kick around the area has been, so what I'm saying is there that it's always been treated as open space uh, on the planning maps and also the um, parish maps show it as open space and maintained by the city. Thank you. Any other questions, members? Yes, Councillor Pearson. Thank you, thank you Chair. Yeah, John, I'm, I'm a little bit puzzled. Uh, quite clearly, if a house has been built on this site, whether the parish council believes it's open space or not, curtilage mm. actually exists. So, how can you still call where the house is space? Are not you that, suggesting not, the house not. Saying the houses, I'm saying the extension where they've moved the fence out from the original fence line. That fence line that they've sh shown there is a good meter, two meters away from the original fence. Originally, it was thought that this was um, a so called land grab. That is the case. That fence line that's shown isn't the original fence line. It moves it out. Are you saying the original fence line of the curtilage? Uh, as I understand from the officer's report, the fence is entirely within the curtilage of the house. It's, it's, that may be on the plan that they have now, but when we, we looked at our original plan, the curtilage was shown as the existing or the old fence line. Subsequently, the map seems to have been wrong, moved it out. But it's still that land was treated as open space since the 70s. Uh, the original fence line was there from the 70s through to last year. I agree the 1970s were a perfect time, but we're 50 years on. Uh, <laughs> what was then is not now. So that's why I'm a little bit bemused. Uh, I, perhaps the, uh, the officer can, uh, case officer can clarify later on. Thank you, John. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any other matters of clarification for um, Councillor Godbold. No, thank you very much indeed, Councillor. Yeah, thank you for listening to me. That's at all. Uh, our next uh, pa um, public contribution is from Ward Councillor, Councillor Brian Laming. Councillor Laming, you know how the uh, microphone operates, and you have five minutes once you've started. Thank you. Uh, Cameron, have you got the presentation? Yes. Sorry, yeah, I, can't, I can't put the timer on the screen at the same time as the presentation. So, if we'll put the presentation up and I'll I'll do the timer offline if that's okay. That's fine. I'm just quicker a... than five minutes anyway. Thank you. This application causes many questions to be asked. The decision has ramifications across the whole of Badger Farm Estate. The land in question has been treated as open space, which I believe is under Section 50 of the order. Many other smaller and larger areas of the estate are. If we allow this to be enclosed, it leaves the whole estate open for development, particularly the larger areas. For example, one area of Section 52 land was sold for approximately 115,000 recently. As yet, we don't know who uh, bought it, but we're pretty sure it wasn't for the benefit of the community as they outbid the parish council and the residents association. If they wish to enclose this land, they need to show that they are replacing it with another area of equal size or greater. Therefore, enclosing the land is in direct conflict with the original planning permission of the whole estate and goes against our planning policies. If we look at the map, that I've shown up there. Um, that area there, it's all in green, and that is the area that's maintained by Winchester City Council as present. Um, and that, if you look along that line there, that is a wall and the rest of it is a hedge. If we go onto the next 
one. This shows what it was looking like um, years ago. And you can see the wall along there goes right along the side of the house. What they've done is they've extended it right the way out there. So that is what you've got going back since the estate was built until recently. Put up the next one, please, Cameron. Thank you. That shows the area now where it's being closed. It takes the line away from the original fence uh, or wall. It really does sort of enclose an, an area which was open and gives the, the effect of the estate being open, although it's a high density estate. We go on to the next one, please. If you look there, it's a bit difficult to see because it's a bit small, but it reduces the sight lines of that particular junction. And that is something which is of paramount importance because of the parking problems that reduces it to single track. And it makes it very difficult when you're coming up the road to see traffic coming around from the left. Next slide, please. This picture illustrates the problems of the sight lines um, where you get a major parking problem and you cannot see around the corner, which you used to be able to. Prior to that, the sight lines were much different and the whole thing was a lot safer for everybody. That is a major walkway going across that road for children going to school. The last slide, please, Cameron. This just shows what it used to look like. And the fence changes the visual structure of the area where front gardens are of an open design and therefore must be considered detrimental and harmful to the area as this particular fence is in the front garden as well. And that will be the only house on 1,100 dwellings on the estate that actually has a six foot fence in their front garden, reducing the whole estate down visual character of the estate. So it's quite harmful in what it does. Um, and that's my presentation. Thank you very much, Councillor Laming. Does anybody have any uh, matters of clarification to ask Councillor Laming, please? Councillor Pearson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Laming, I, I'm still puzzled. Uh, is, is this, are you suggesting this is the only house on the Badge Farm State that's uh, is there because of infilling? No, what I'm saying is that that's the only house on the estate which has a six foot, uh, well, two metre high arch flat fence right. in the front garden. Okay. Um, so it's the the actual location of the fence you're complaining, you, you are objecting yeah. to? Yeah. Because you're enclosing, the, you're narrowing down the visual structure of that particular part of the road, you're causing a sight line problem at the end. You're putting a fence in somebody's in a front garden, which is uncommon, it doesn't exist on Badger Farm, it doesn't exist on other places like you know, Tag Down, changing the whole of the planning statement for the whole of the city by looking at this and putting a structure in the front garden. A little bit nervous about this, there's at least a dozen in my uh, ward, similar situations, and you, I, you're almost trying to create a precedent. About uh, fencing in, within an urban area, but uh, the question that I'm, I'm trying to get on, uh, as I understand it from the uh, case officer report, the fence is entirely within the curtilage of the house. Is yeah. that how you understand it? Um, I haven't seen any proof either way. To be honest, um, what I am saying is that there are lots of parcels of land on the estate which come under other people's ownership and they are maintained as open space. Um, I have a section of a small section of land associated with my house which mm. is open space and I wouldn't dream of trying to put anything around it. I mean, this is one of the reasons why permitted development rights have been withdrawn on the estate and there is no fencing allowed unless it has planning permission. Mm. And because all the gardens are open plan, the front gardens, this destroys the whole of that yeah, but uh, that, that condition only applies for 10 years after the house is uh, occupied. Yeah, but it's still, if you want to uh, have a put a fence up, you have to 
have planning permission. That's permitted development line. That's why this is here. Okay, thank you very much. I think that's covered, Councillor Pearson. Councillor Westwood. Thank you, Chair. Um, Brian, just, just a question on what is defined as front garden here. So I have been to look at it. When you look at the house, the front is actually in the estate, the front door, um, and not onto the main road. Um, so the fence runs from um, the, near the corner on the main road and then curls around the front of the house. Is it all of the fence that you're saying is front garden, or is it well, a portion of the there's fence? Two, there's, two, there's two points. The part of the fence goes from the front of the house to the road. That, in my opinion, is front garden. The second point is you're enclosing an area that is deemed as an open space and used by the public. You're also cutting down the visual... You're, you're having a problem with the visual impact of that fence. Okay, I think, I think you've made all those points, yeah. Councillor Lane. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Westwood. Any other matters of clarification? No? Thank you very much, Councillor Laming. So now we return to our presenting officer, Mr Cam Cameron Taylor. Um, I'm sure you've got things that you want to comment on, if you would, um, not least the ownership of the land and fencing of front gardens, etc. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So in regards to, I say, the ownership of the land, I say, I've been in contact with our estates team, which they've confirmed, they say, the areas which have been marked in green on there is what they've shown on their system as being in ownership of number 119, uh, May, May Tree Close itself. So the fence in the area which is in ownership of said property. Yeah. OK, thank you. That's all you wanted to say in updates. OK, we now move to Questions to the officer, Councillor McLean. Thank you, Chair. Um, looking at this very well-thumbed document now, and referring to page 49, 5.74 and 5.75, in your deliberations, how did you feel that um, agreeing to the application Knowing the application conforms to those two points in our very important document, because I personally don't see them as being conforming to those two points. Unfortunately, off the top of my head, I can't. I, I'm not 100 certain as to what what those points are you're referring to. You wouldn't mind doing so, yes, please. 5.74, it is essential to ensure that new boundary treatment, especially that which forms part of the street scene, is high quality contextual, durable, and relates positively to the overall design for the site development, so that it forms an attractive part of the overall composition of buildings and an external space. It also talks about planting. Planting is a very sympathetic form of boundary treatment. However, this needs to be sufficiently dense and robust to provide a suitable size to fulfill its function from the outset, which it already did, now being replaced by something that I don't believe conforms to 5.74. So in relation to, say, the appearance of the fencing, you say it was considered during the application, it was considered just due to the nature and character of the area that it wouldn't cause significant adverse harm in relation just due to the residential nature with examples of fencing within the immediate area itself. Excuse me if I can come back. So we heard, I think, Councillor Laming say um, that there was no other fencing like it, that height in the area. Um, are you now saying that there is? And if so... In regards to sort of the... the Immediate area of the property, there's the fencing to number one, made you close itself, which side of the road, which we sort of viewed it in relation to those fences, to, to say not, not be detrimental, significant adverse harm to the character of the area, and say just due to the nature of the pro location of the property itself, and say and the, the residential nature of the area. Thank you, Councillor McLean. Councillor Reid. Thank you, Chair. Can I just have a confirmation first? On our update sheet, it says, I'm sure it's a mistake, a 20 metre natural wood fence, two metre wood fence. It's actually 1.8 metres. It's got 1.8, which is not two metres. No, I think it's 20 metres is the length, 1.8 metres is the height. 
Can I ask then, just concern that we have on our enforcement list properties that have put up a fence of a similar height. We've got enforcement action taken against them because it's adjacent to a highway. Trying very hard to think why not taking a similar action here. This is 20 metres long, adjacent to a highway. That's um, Lawn Hutchins could advise. Will do, thank you, Chair. In terms of each application and each report that we might get about a fence, there are a lot of people that want to enclose garden areas and put fences that happen to be adjacent to the highway. Because they're adjacent to the highway, it then means that they probably need planning permission. But we do have to consider each fence on its own individual merits because they're in all different parts across the district um, and have all different spaces and visual issues for us to consider. So in this case, this fence, we are recommending approval as acceptable, having assessed it against the des design policies, because we feel that there's a similar fence in the area that there's enough space that's being retained to retain that important characteristic of Badger Farm. And so in that case, this fence, having considered it in all, con in all ways, on its own merits, is recommended for approval. I'll just come back to that. Um, I understood that when it's adjacent to a you couldn't go over a metre and adjacent to a highway. This... It, it's about permitted development. If it's not permitted development, that just means that we have control of it and then we have to assess it against our own policies. In this case, had this one um, had not been in Badger Farm and had um, its permitted development removed, it, we would probably assess that this was permitted development because that distance means it's probably not adjacent to the highway. But in Badger Farm, we have control over this, whether it's a metre or two metres, because permitted development rights have been removed. So one metre is about it being permitted development, not whether it's acceptable in terms of assessing a planning application. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Reid. Councillor Edwards. Uh, thank you, Chair. Can we go back to the estates map? The map is helpful, but only goes so far. It doesn't show the house. It doesn't show the edges of roadways. So just just for the avoidance of doubt sorry just a minute councillor edwards i'm afraid that councillor reed is having to leave the meeting now thank you very much councillor reed sorry carry on councillor edwards just for the avoidance of doubt can it be clarified that the boundary of the green land is the same as the boundary now demarcated by the new Uh, I, I believe that the area shown by the green map itself, whilst that's shown the entirety of the area owned, I don't believe the entirety of the fence itself, perhaps say it's that entire area, I believe it might be slightly in from that itself, so it doesn't take up the entirety of what is currently in ownership. Beyond that. It, it, it sort of what turns to be the area sort of what the fencing be located on the plan there. <laughs> projects further out, which they say, uh, from my understanding, does. Say that the fencing cost doesn't. The entirety of fencing is within the curtains of the listed building, or in the building itself, sorry, I'm just getting. Thank you, that's great. Sorry about clear that. now, thank you. Could I ask a question? Yeah, so. How far back from the road edge is this new? Sort of in, it's probably best to sort of be viewed from a photo itself because say, unfortunately, I'm not 100 certain on the exact measurements myself, and they said that would change depending on where where measured. So I say this is a photo from within on this or sort of the entrance, which looks directly towards the property itself, which we can see there is there is some land which has been retained in be between. The boundary of the property itself and the actual road entry close. So, would you say it's at least one and a half meters minimum from I'd the say road edge? At least edge? one and a half meters minimum. As they and were, mostly minimum. wider than that. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, are there any other 
questions on any other parts of this report to our officer. If there are no more questions. We'll go into debate. A debate. Right, I'll start, if I may. Thank you. Um, OK, I've looked very carefully at this, and I'm, I am concerned that Brian, Councillor Laming, has raised some um, important issues. We have taken away the development rights from this uh, whole area, and there is a particular character of open spaces, um, which is very important to retain. However, I think in this case, our officer has done their job very thoroughly. They have checked the ownership of the land. This fence does not go outside the ownership of the land. In fact, it's inside it. The sight lines um, from the pictures that I've seen, and I've driven past as well, I don't consider that the sight lines have in fact been impacted. They might have been impacted from 10 years ago, but now you can see that the vegetation has grown, the tree has grown significantly. And in fact, that tree is giving more impact on sight lines than the fence ever will. And in terms of the character of the area, we can see from the photographs ourselves, literally opposite, there is a fence of the same height and the same style. I think that people should be allowed to enclose their gardens, particularly if they've got children or pets that they don't want to run out onto the road. It seems a shame that you know our planning policies should, should stop people from enjoying their own um, gardens in a safe way. Um, so I do not consider that there is significant adverse harm to the neighbourhood from this fence. It is being considered on its own. It does not set a precedent for the area. Um, and uh, so I am content to support the officer recommendation. Are there any other contributions to debate, please? Councillor McLean. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just go back again, um, and I'm still trying to decide whether or not I can support the officer's decision, which is 5.74 in our own document, because I do not believe that it is high quality. Wooden fence, sorry. We, we are asking for more in our own document, and it would appear that we're not getting it. We're just getting a wooden fence around somebody's garden. Um, it's durable, yes. Does it relate? positively to the overall design of the site development. I'm not sure that it does. So I can find two reasons not to support it. I also listen to what you say in your presentation, Chair. So I'm still undecided. Councillor McLean, any others? No more debate, so we go to the decision. So can I see all those in favour of supporting the officer recommendation to approve this application? Five members, Chair. Six. six. Matthew, six. Sorry, I could only see five there. Sorry. Can we just show again, please? Put your hands nice and high, Chris. Oh, Thank yeah, you. Yeah, beg your pardon. I couldn't see Councillor Westwood. No, six members, Chair. Okay. Can I see those against? One against. Thank you very much. So that application is approved. Thank you. We'll just take a quick break whilst. Um, Oh, actually, we've got the same presentation, some pre presenting officer, haven't we? So, OK. Councillor Reid, are you, are you OK to stay now? That's good news. Wonderful, OK. <laughs> well, we're delighted to welcome you back into the meeting. Thank you, Councillor Reid. And Councillor Laming is now taking his place back as a member of the Planning Committee. So. Back up to full numbers, I think. Good. So the next item on the agenda is item number seven, um, which is 2 Imber Road, Winchester, reference number 220921HOU. And the presenting officer again is Cameron Taylor. So if you'd like to take it away, Cam. Thank you very much, Chair. This presentation is for a first floor side extension to 2 Imber Road, which is currently an existing HMO as it, with a, being a licensed HMO for six beds. So here we have the location plan, property situated to the northwest of the junction between Road and Whittle Manor Road itself. 
with the proposed extension and being situated over this existing projection here of the west elevation of the property. You have an aerial photograph of the site marked by the yellow triangle. And in regard to the proposed extension itself, it will include glazings on the south and west elevation, with the west elevation glazing being high level and obscure glaze. The um, is this section here where the Here we have the front and side elevations with the side being the east, with the top photos being the existing and the bottom ones being proposed. Again, I just highlight that the proposed extension being situated over the existing uh, projection off the, that elevation of the property itself, okay, in which we can see the front glazing is a full length glazing. You can see that's to the front looking to public realm. Here we have the photos looking towards the front elevation, the left hand photo being of the full property itself. Right hand photo showing the location of where the extension will sit on top of that existing, ele existing element of the property. Next, have the rear and side elevations, the side being the west, and again, top ones being existing, bottom ones being proposed. And say no additional glades into the rear of the property with, the, as I say, the high level obscure glaze window situated off that side of west elevation. Here we have a photo of the rear elevation itself, of that rear existing projection a photo looking towards that west elevation with the property and that existing ground single story element. Again, I have some more photos of the side elevations, the left hand photo being the east, which will not be affected. And again, one a bit further back from the street looking towards the west elevation of the property. Next, we have the floor plans with the left hand set of, left -hand set of drawings being the existing and the right hand drawings being the proposed. I note that the number of bedrooms to the property will not be changing. It will still be retained as a six bed HMO itself. We have a photo looking towards the north boundary, which is the left hand photo, the north boundary, that small little brickwork being that single story element which, which the extension will be situated. And the right hand photo being further from within the garden towards that western boundary. We have some photos again from within the, within the garden site looking to the west elevation we can see the relation between that single story element and the distance between the boundary to the north. That concludes my presentation with the, office, with the officer's recommendation being for approval. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cam. I now go to public speaking. Um, we have four public, it's public speakers, yes. We have, first of all, we have Alice May, who is an objector. So, Alice, if you'd like. You'll have three minutes from when you start speaking. Press the button at the bottom of the microphone. If you could just sort of make sure you're speaking directly into it, not too close, but just directly into it. You can move it around if you need to. That contribution. Um, members, do we have any questions of clarification? Councillor Reid. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, sorry to hear of all your problems. Um, could you just confirm whether you live to the west? I'm trying to get my bearings. We're joined onto in the uh, joined onto the you're joined, Ah, you're that one to the north. I don't know north, of that, but we're we party wall. We joined onto that house. Thank you very much. I'll come. Any other questions? Thank you so much for coming along and um, as I say, we can sort something out for you. Okay, um, the next contribution is from Councillor Becker. Yes, hello Kathleen. You have five minutes, Kathleen, and um, we have Thank to you, just to confirm, it is just me. It was either Councillor Tippett Cooper or I attending today, so it is. Thank you. It's just me. Uh, we've been contacted by local residents about this application. It's, as you've seen and heard, it's not well cared for. It is an HMO and it is a semi-detached property that's not particularly clear from the plans or the description, but it, it, is, it lies on the junction, so two Imber Road is connected to 67 Winnell Manor Road. Um, some residents don't feel comfortable sharing their concerns in person or in writing, which is why we've requested that this application be called in. 
The concerns that have been raised with us are that the proposed extension will have a material impact on the attached property. The extension will cause an imbalance between the two halves of the building and make the garden of the attached property feel far more enclosed than it currently does. There will be a loss of amenity with some loss of sunlight and a loss of privacy with people in the bedroom able to look into the garden of the attached property. There's also an important precedent issue. This is seeking another bedroom, although we've heard that it doesn't increase the number of bedrooms. How long is it before we hear that they are seeking you know, the, build, the rooms already there? Why not just seek the license for an additional room? There are many HMOs in the Winnell area. Allowing extensions of those existing HMOs will set a precedent for, for the other HMOs. We already know that there are applications being sought. There's one in Beijing Close that has that the application's already been submitted. Larger, as everyone knows, late, larger HMOs have a negative impact on the neighbours and the local community. Two to three bedroom family homes are being lost, permanently lost. Those are the homes that first time home buyers would be able to purchase, yet they're being converted into six bedroom homes that no, no young family living in the Winnell area could expect to be able to afford. Winnell is one of the few remaining affordable areas in Winchester. When a landlord purchases these properties, they think they can then seek to extend the property, they can squeeze more students in, they can maximise their return, and all of that is at the detriment to the community that is built up in the area. And the Winnell community is a wonderful community. It's a very long-standing community, wonderful families, a really great sense of community and cohesion, and that is being lost through, first of all, the introduction of the HMOs and now the extension of these HMOs. So we, we do seek that this application is declined. Thanks. Thank you very much, Councillor Becker. Uh, does anybody have any questions of clarification? Councillor Pearson, thank you. Uh, Councillor Becker, are you aware that this house already has license to be an HMO yes, with six bedrooms? Yes, of course. And it's already causing severe detriment to the neighbours. Are you also aware that there's nothing in this application that suggests that the number of bedrooms will increase? In fact, all they will do, they'll increase in size, but they won't increase in number. Well, if you increase the size, then what was previously a bedroom for one person can become a bedroom for two people. Are you aware that study bedrooms for students, there are design codes laid down and the officer reports that it is to meet those design codes, wants to, in, I presume he, my apologies, not, wants to increase the size of the bedrooms? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not aware of that, Councillor Pearson. The point is that by seeking to build an extension, there is going to be greater space for the inclusion of more people in the house and a cumulative effect where further down the line there may be an application for the number of bedrooms to be extended. Okay, so, thank you. Thank you very much. We can't, we can't decide this application on, on speculation about what might happen in the future, I'm afraid. We just have to look at what's in front of us. Are there any more questions of clarification for Councillor Becker? Nope. Yes, Councillor McLean, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, just one, if I may. There's obviously a lot of emotion here, as we've heard with the presentation earlier. But um, what I'm not hearing, and I, I don't think I've heard it from your good self, Councillor, any policy reasons why we should object. I wonder, have you had a chance to look into this and come up with any policy reasons within our documentation why we should object to this? Unfortunately, unfortunately not. Um, Obviously, we have the Article 4 in place in Winnell to restrict the creation of new HMOs, and what we seem to be seeing is the extension of the existing HMOs instead. I, I not. Thank you. And I hope we can address that in the new local plan, because I would love to see a policy to that effect. Thank you very much, Councillor Baker. Thank you very much for your contribution today. Thank you. Okay, we now move on to the supporter, who is James Coleman, the applicant. James, if you'd like to come forward. Thank you. You will have three minutes. You have three minutes from when you start speaking. Mr. Coleman. 
Yeah, hello everyone. My name is James Coleman. Um, my wife and I completed on the purchase of number two Inver Road only last week, and we are keen to invest further in the property to improve its appearance and layout. We certainly do not want to cause any issues for the neighbours. We are keen to improve things for everyone, and we believe these alterations will. The dwelling has a current licence as a six bedroom HMO. We are not looking to increase the number of rooms and or increase occupants, just maintain and improve what is already there. The sole purpose of the proposed works is to increase the size of the existing rooms to improve the occupants' living space, all things very much encouraged by the local housing officers. We feel this is very much misunderstood by the objections with uh, reference to additional bedrooms. There are no extra bedrooms and the property will continue in its current lawful use. Therefore, not an additional burden on the neighbouring properties in terms of noise and parking. As you will appreciate, we can't comment uh, on historical antisocial behaviour and uh, because we were then not the, the owners. But what I can say is, unlike previously, we will now have this property fully managed by a local letting agency, meaning any issues can be easily reported and these will be stamped out promptly. They will also manage the ongoing maintenance of the property and the gardens, etc. The proposed alterations do not overshadow any neighbouring properties, nor are any neighbours overlooked. The distance from the boundary results in overshadowing being insignificant, and the one window which could cause an issue is intentionally noted as having obscure glass. In my opinion, all these points are not reasons to refuse this application. What we propose will clearly improve the building and the surrounding area, which will benefit everyone. I can't help but feel that this, that the objections are directed more at the planning policy of HMOs in Winnow in general, rather than this application specifically. Therefore, may I respectfully um, ask that your decision is taken on the merits of this application alone and we're not drawn into the wider debate surrounding Article 4. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Coleman. I'd just like to wait there in case that is a clarification. Councillor Reid. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Reid, can you speak into your microphone Sorry. rather than Sorry, yeah, point it towards your mouth? Um, with regards to the bedrooms, can you assure us that there is not going to be additional members living in there? The only reason I ask this question is because all the bedrooms, bar one, are shown with a single bed. The new one is shown with a double bed. So does that mean the actual occupancy is going to increase? The occupancy will not increase. Um, if you look at the proposed and the existing, there are um, the, there's a, a new configuration of layout throughout the house. Um, and yeah, overall, I think I think the the images that you see uh, with the bed sizes are just for uh, illustration rather than any more than that. Thank you, Councillor Reid. Councillor Pearson and then Councillor. Uh, uh, James. Uh, it, your present license is for a six bed study bedroom unit. Uh, I appreciate that you're going to enlarge the study bedrooms. I had uh, three grandchildren and a daughter going through study bedroom situations. I appreciate giving them more space. Uh, so, in that, I've got to declare first, might be a first answer, it's certainly not prejudicial. Uh, would you have any objection that a condition was imposed that you could not increase the number of bedrooms beyond six? I wouldn't object to that, no. Thank you. Um, okay, so we have Councillor Clear and then Councillor Westwood. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Coleman, um, I know you realise that if you do have more than six, even one more, you will need an extra or another planning application and a licence. So can you assure us, I hope so, that you won't be going any higher than six students? And I know Mr. 
Councillor Pearson said the condition, which I think is probably quite a good idea. Um, but I would uh, just ask you, I suppose, you do realise that if you have even one more, then you are um, needing a new application and a new licence. Yes, I understand that. Councillor Westwood. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's just one question, uh, Mr. Coleman, on the, the layout, the new layout. So the existing layout has a lounge area. Uh, you know, I've also had this situation. I know that when you're occupying a house of this nature, you do like to meet with your mates as well and watch a bit of football on the television or wherever. Um, the new layout removes the lounge. Is there an expectation that uh, the, the occupants will not meet communally other than in the kitchen? New layout. I think, I think as, a, as, a, as a trend, the lounge isn't used as much as the kitchen area is which is why in the uh, original layout there was a bedroom next to the kitchen which the kitchen has now been extended to to increase the kitchen area so that the, the kitchen is a kitchen diner with complete communal space chair may i just make one comment beyond that um, yeah, my ahead. concern with that arrangement is that we've already heard the distressing um, stories from the neighbours next door um, that without a communal area where people could meet and do you know, the social activities that that may drive more activity out into the uh, the garden area certainly during the summer months that there. I'm sure that's duly noted thank you councillor thank Westwood you. any other matters of clarification for mr coleman Thank you so much for coming along today. Could I just say, um, I obviously sympathise with the lady that spoke before, and I'd be more than happy to have a chat with her following this meeting okay, to lovely. see if there's any way we can Thank help. Thank you. Thank you. We're very pleased to hear that. If you could just turn the microphone off. That's lovely. Thank you very much. Yeah. Can we just hear from our legal officer, please, a, a matter of clarification? Thank you. If you could just take that outside of the meeting room, please. Thank you. Chair, I just wanted to clarify because it has come up that an increase in bedrooms or an increase in residents would require planning placement. And for that reason, a condition shouldn't be imposed and isn't required because a planning application would be required. Thank you very much for that. Good. OK, let's move on then to um, questions on the whole report. Uh, oh, Cameron, do you have anything to um, um, update us on? I've got nothing further to update okay. on, thank you, Chair. OK, so questions on the whole report to our presenting officer, please. Are there any questions? I have a question. Oh, sorry, Councillor Reid. Thank you, Chair. Just looking at page 49, which shows some shadowing from the aerial photography, can you confirm, Cameron, the actual geographical location? Is that picture we're looking at there and north south? So what we're seeing there is the afternoon shadows across the front of adjacent property. Yeah, see, so that's correct. That's a photo is due north. Yeah. Makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on the report to our officer? If there are no more questions, we'll move into debate. Councillor Clear. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mrs May, we all feel for what you've said here today. Um, and I trust that Mr Coleman will get together with you and sort a few <laughs> things out and hope that in the future it is better for you. But this application here today we can't decide on speculation, um, as already been said, what will happen in the future. This is a case of reconfiguring the internal layout to apply with the licence and the bedrooms no longer meet the minimum size. So we have to vote on or decide on what is in front of us in the application. But Mr Coleman, please, may I ask that you get together with this is May and have a good talk, but I will be approving this application. Thank you. 
Councillor Pearson. Uh, yes, I agree with everything Councillor Curry has said. Um, I, I've got to say, in my experience of my daughter and grandchildren living in similar properties, uh, girls t tend to make less noise than boys. Uh, maybe I'm being sexist when I say that, but that's just in my experience. Uh, the, uh, my also experience is that uh, certainly with my uh, daughter, a study bedroom which is too small is really absolute agony for the student and uh, just does not is not conducive to the work the student does. Um, the noise issue, and I sympathise very much with what Mrs. May has said, is I think something that the landlord needs to arrange with the students as a condition that the noise um, should be kept to the minimum. Um, although I, I must admit, when you get a group of six speaking together, as demonstrated frequently in a restaurant, they do tend to gradually raise their voice to make themselves heard. We do the same actually in this room if we're all speaking at the same time. We're not allowed to. Because uh, Councillor certainly not bumps us with a with a mallet, um, but it, it it is an issue. Um, thank you, though, for thinking this, and I agree with what again Councillor Kerr said. These study bedrooms have got to be meet acceptable standards. This is what the university or college, which I presume these students go to, um, lay down of their landlords, and. Thank you very much, Mr. Coleman, for taking that on hand and doing something about quite clearly your existing properties doesn't meet those standards. Uh, thank you for Cameron for report succinct to the point and very clear. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Leeming. Thank you. Having looked at this and having some experience of these type of properties, I'm very concerned that the communal area has been lost. And we're trying to shoehorn something into a footprint, which is really too small in the first place. And I'm very concerned about that. And, uh, I need to think about this quite hard before I take a decision, because I do feel, on one hand, that it's overdevelopment in there. OK. Um, I'll put my. Penny within after Councillor McLean, thank you. Oh, I can't, thank you. Um, okay, I wanted to just um, react to that comment from Councillor Laming. Um, as a mother of three past students who've lived in assorted accommodation, um, first of all, can I say I'm pleased, Mr. Coleman, that you've taken this on. And you're clearly going to take a very responsible attitude to being a landlord of students. Um, and I'm assuming that that will include very strict. Um, house rules that the students will have to adhere to um, and you're going to invest in this property to make it a much better nicer place to live which will then attract better and nicer students um, and hopefully that will deal with any issues with the neighbours and I'm, I'm sure that that's going to happen I'm sure things are going to improve for you today. Um, we can't stop it being an HMO it's already got that license it's already got that planning approval and this does not improve increase the number of bedrooms and in fact the, the license applies to the number of people in the house not the number of the number of bedrooms so any increase on six students in the house will have to get a new license and a new planning application um, the communal area from my point of view I think I think this this living kitchen most people live in their kitchens don't they these days these living dining kitchens um, I, I disagree. I think it's plenty of space for them most of the time. If they're, you know, serious students, they'll be studying in their rooms, uh, which will be now large enough for them to do that effectively. Um, and uh, or they'll be gathering with their friends outside, you know, not outside in the garden, but in town, in bars, in the library, hopefully, all those sorts of places. So I'm, I don't share the concern about the communal area. I think it's adequate. Um, and um, I, I have high hopes that things will significantly improve on this HMO um, um, now that it's been taken over by a, a responsible landlord, which I think is the key thing. So I will be supporting the officer recommendation. 
Um, Councillor, Councillor McLean, was it? Yes. That's me. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm struggling reading through um, policies we've got to find a way I can object to this. Um, overdevelopment, Councillor Laming's comment, I think um, it is. But um, I've got to come up with a, if, if we do vote against it, we've got to come up with a policy reason for doing so. And because it's an already licensed HMO, I am struggling to find something to come up to go against it. I can't see the necessity for sticking the extension on it um, and then keep the same number of bedrooms, having gained two more downstairs in the, in the lounge area. So help everybody. If anybody's got any policy reasons that I don't know, would you come up with them? OK, I think that's it on debate. Yes. Oh, no, Councillor Reid, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll try not to cover any of the items that have already been mentioned. The only one that I would say right at the beginning, there was a concern over overshadowing. And looking at the photograph of I've already pointed out on page 49, I think that will be quite minimal. Um, it will exist to a small extent, but not to the extent that possibly the neighbouring some fears because one of its location, it's on the opposite side of the house. The major shadowing is coming in the afternoon sun across the whole of the neighbour's front garden. I believe, Chair, that um, this does conform to planning law and I can find no reason in planning terms to be able to go against the officers, so I will be voting in favour of it. Thank you very much. Councillor Pearson, you yes, want to have uh, another yeah, just to add a condition. Uh, sorry, uh, a, a comments were made about this uh, tidiness of the site, um, which, judged by the photographs, is justified. Is there any way we can make sure that site is managed properly? No litter, uh, grass cut. Uh, is that landlord's responsibility? Or That's a, li a licensing matter. It is a licensing Pearson. matter. Yeah. So that would cover it. So if, yeah. if, the, if the students have a party out there, they've got to clear their mess up. And I'm sure the landlord will have plenty to say about those. Sorts well, that's, of what it, that's what I'm saying. We don't need to condition that. Okay. Councillor Westwood. Thank you. Just one question on the conditions, Chair. So I just looked through them. I don't see the condition explicitly talking about the obscure glazing on that window. I'm just asking if that is covered within the proposed plans and drawings to ensure that that is there. Cameron, is that the case? Uh, yes, on the floor plans, I'll just bring that up. So it's highlighted within the floor plans that it will be an obscure glazed window to that west elevation. Just to add, if it's on the plans, we should, to, to ensure it and to make sure it's enforceable, we could put a condition on that would insist that it um, is installed within a certain time frame. We've got a standard condition for that. Thank you. Let's add that condition. Thank you, Councillor Westwood, for that. Any further debate? No? OK. We come to the um, decision then. So this application um, is recommended for approval. So can I see those in favour of permitting this application? Thank you very much. We're now going to take a, and that's with a new condition as, as agreed, and I'll just formally agree that with the, uh, with the officers in due course. We're going to take a break now um, um, in time to allow members time to go and get a coffee. So I suggest that we return here at five past 11. OK, five past 11, everybody. Thank you. Oh, all right. I'll change that to 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock. We'll start again at 11.
Okay, welcome back to this morning's meeting committee. I'm Jane Rutter, Vice Chair of the Planning Committee and taking the chair for this meeting. Um, I'd just like to remind people that the meeting is being audio recorded and live streamed from the Council's website. In addition, a video recording of the meeting will be uploaded to the Council's YouTube channel after. Okay, let's move on to item number eight on our agendas, which is <clears throat> reference number 2103015LIS, listed building application. And this is at Three Week Manor House, Lloyd, Square, Winchester. Um, could I just clarify at the moment, it's, uh, the application is in the name of Mrs. Michaela Todd. Obviously, she's married to councillor Martin Todd who is um, a member of the City Council and in fact the leader of the City Council and that is why this application is before the committee. Right, our presenting officer this, uh, this morning is Rose Chapman for this item. So Rose, if we could turn to you, thank you for your presentation. Thank you Chair. Um, just a verbal update for you, um, there are there is an extra slide at the end of this presentation with a bit more clarity in the windows. So here we have the red line plan at the point of the cursor. Here we have the rear elevation highlighting the two ground floor windows that have been replaced. Here we have a photograph of the first floor windows that were replaced and just as a point of clarification the historic officer report mentions a um, set of French windows which were replaced as part of the 2018 application so these are not the ones that are currently in situ. Here we have the plan showing the first floor windows that were replaced highlighted in red. And here we have the photograph of the windows that were replaced on the ground floor highlighted in red on the right hand side. Uh, just as a point of clarification from the 2018 application, these are the first floor windows that show the windows that were replaced and on the bottom we have the windows that are currently in situ. The recommendation is to permit. Thank you very much uh, Rose. So we don't have any public speaking for this item so we will go straight to Members' questions on the report. We'll take the whole report. Do we have any questions for our officer? Councillor Pearson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, it's a question of clarification. Um, the officer quite correctly identifies this as a Grade 2 listed building. Um, I assume, therefore, that uh, histo our Historic England people have agreed the design of these windows as being a fair match to the existing windows rest of the building uh, rather than a 21st century design uh, could you clarify that situation because it's not quite clear from the pictures you've shown us thank you and um, the windows that have been installed are slightly different so on the top here you can see the slight detailing around the inside of the casement um, which is slightly thicker and has been reduced in the lower ones that have been implemented this has been discussed by the historic environment officer and has been deemed to be acceptable again also the windows i presume the new windows are all double glazed um, Existing windows are Victorian with reeded glass, uh, which are not double glazed. Now, is that with an agreement with Historic England? In the past, they've uh, flinched at that. I'm assuming that all that is now in agreement. Thank you. So the windows, 
that have been replaced were replaced in 2003 as part of the application to convert the building into residential. So the windows that are shown at the top here from 2018, these are date from 2003, not from Victorian times. We had a similar discussion about when we converted the main building of the Knoll apartment. We asked about double glazing and stuff in Stoddick, England at that time, different personnel said no, but really glass had to stay, and if the windows were broken, they had to be replaced by really glass, which we don't make anymore. Now, so has that point been clarified? I mean, you, you, you're saying something, we agreed to this in 2003. Now, 2003 is when we're looking at the null redevelopment buildings. Councillor Pearson, I think you're comparing apples with oranges because those windows were the originals, I understand. Yes. And these windows were replaced, were put in in 2003 as part of the original. Oh, so, the yes. Okay. Am I right? That's, yes. That's correct. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions on the whole report, please? No questions? Debate. No debate. We will move to the decision. So this this um, application is recommended for approval. Can I see those in favour of that recommendation, please? That's unanimous, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, so that application has been approved. Thank you. Just have a slight pause whilst our presenting officers swap over. Thank you. Um, in fact, I'd, I'd quite like to just for the record record that Councillor Westwood had to leave the meeting um, at the coffee break. He had another um, urgent uh, engagement that he had to attend. So we've been without Councillor Westwood since the coffee break. I think all other members are here as before. Okay, uh, are we now ready? Megan? Yeah, lovely. So the next um, item on our agenda, item number nine, is at 54 Cheriton Road, Winchester, reference number 220611HOU. The officer presenting is Megan Osborne. If you'd like to give us your presentation. Thank you, Megan. Thank you. Can you cl clarify the applicant again? Oh, yes, sorry, I meant to do that. Sorry, thank you for the reminder, Councillor Pearson. Yes, this is um, an application by Mr. David Ferguson, um, who, of course, is married to... Mrs. Paula Ferguson, or Councillor Paula Ferguson, who is an elected member of the City Council and indeed a Cabinet member, and that is why this application is before committee. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this application is for number 54 Cheriton Road. It's a large detached property um, that backs onto Cheriton Road and um, fronts onto the side access road. Um, and the other houses in the area, all within the immediate area, are large detached property lots. See, there's a lot of vegetation around the site, and it fronts, oh, sorry, backs onto the Cheriton Road. This application is for the replacement of the materials on the roof, which are currently concrete tiles, and they would like to replace them with slate tiles. Um, this requires plan permission under Class A of the GDPA, as it consists of a change of material from the existing dwelling. This is the rear elevation, of and this is the front elevation where the roof tile replaced by two slate. And this is a photo looking from Cheriton Road towards the rear of the property. So you can see the roof is quite visible, but I don't um, consider it to be. Um, an impact to the character of the area and actually an improvement to the appearance of the dwelling house. Thank you, Chair. Oh, sorry, this is recommended for approval. 
Thank you very much, Megan. We don't again have any public speaking, um, so uh, I'll go straight to questions on the entire report. Megan, if report. Questions? So, debate. Any debate? Councillor Pearson. Yeah, sh short and brief. I think it's an eminently sensible proposal. Um, if there's a problem with the roof, um, replace it, which effectively is what uh, uh, Mr. Ferguson is proposing and doing. And while he's replacing it, build the photovoltaics into the roof. And uh, frankly, I think we'll come up with a much better situation. You won't get moss growing on this slate anyway, which may be against biodiversity, but uh, uh, I think if we turn this one down, frankly, I think we'd be a bit perverse. That's my opinion. Thank you, Councillor Pearson. Councillor Reid. Oh, sorry, did you not have your hand up? No, no. I was just pointing you across the other side. Oh, thank you. Okay. Any other contributions to debate? No. So this application is recommended for approval. Can I see all those members in favour of that recommendation, please? It's unanimous, Chair. Members, lovely. Thank you very much. That application is approved. Thank you. Again, a slight pause whilst we um, swap our presenting officers. Get the presentation ready. Very good. So we're now on item number 10 on our agendas, which is at 1 Chase Grove, Waltham Chase, reference number 2200117HOU. And our presenting officer is Rose Chapman again. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Here we have the red line plan. And an aerial view. The Buildings currently occupy this area at the back of the plot that is mostly standing. Here are the elevations and the floor plans. So originally it was constructed to form a playroom, office, two offices and bathroom. It is now in use as a bedroom, bathroom, kitchen and lounge. Here we have the view from the front of the property, just about visible here. Here is the view of the building from the garden. And this is the view of the rear of the dwelling from the outbuilding. Here we have the view of the outbuilding and the boundary with the neighbour. Again, this is the boundary to the rear and the outbuilding from the neighbour. Here is the view from the neighbour's house and you can just about see the top the roof of the buildings here at the center. The recommendation is to approve. Thank you, Rose. We now go to public speaking. We have two speakers today. Um, we have Helen Wilkes first. I'd like to just come forward, Helen. Thank you. Oh, right. If you just put on the microphone, then we can hear you. Sorry. Thank you. It's Will Key. It Will doesn't Key. doesn't matter, um, but I didn't know if it was. That's, That's lovely. Correct. Thank you very much for that clarification. 
So when you're ready, um, you will have three minutes and it'll be Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm here representing the residents of Chase Grove. I live next door and the pictures on there and Grace behind me is the immediate neighbour to the other side on the right. The other neighbours that have submitted written ob objections have been consulted and what I present to you today is our collective view. We feel this, this retrospective application is an abuse of process. The occupiers never intended to use this building as incidental. It was built with the sole intention of it being a separate dwelling. As we as neighbours were not given an opportunity to dis discuss the implications, we are totally uncomfortable with this building. It overlooks our homes and it's very intrusive. The building was completed in February 2022 and Mrs Farragher moved into it straight away. These buildings have never been used as offices or a playroom as stated. Buildings are higher than the garden and the windows and patio doors pointing towards all neighbouring properties at both sides and at the back. The occupiers have a very clear view directly into living space living spaces including our lounges and for me my bedroom which has not been included on those photographs we have no privacy we are not able to enjoy our gardens in the similar way that we used to we have we have a right to a private and family life this building is very unattractive it's constructed of different bare, bare bricks and breeze blocks that's not sympathetic to the surroundings at all and does not match any buildings in the vicinity that's also not covered on those photographs. It is of poor quality. Um, it's been built with inadequate footings and drainage. We suffer light pollution from this building due to the vast number of windows. We have people coming and going all day and night as this place is a separate home. The occupiers have intentionally misled building control and planning enforcement who have been diligently conducting site visits to seek compliance. The, op the occupiers have shown complete disregard to the advice and guidance they have been given. No consideration has been given to the access to the property and the building and additional parking implications that we now face. The construction is not sympathetic to the surrounding area. It is in contradiction to the local development policies. We as local residents have not had an opportunity to object to the design and construction because the planning process has been completely bypassed. If you were to authorise this structure to remain in any capacity, we have no doubt that it will always be used as a dwelling, regardless of the promises and assurances the occupier makes. This would have a lasting negative impact on our homes permanently. The mission would also set a dangerous precedent for allowing back garden developments in the village, and others may also exploit the permitted development rules in the same way. We consider that, please consider the circumstances in which this, which this application has been made. We would request that you consider this application as if the building works had not commenced and would you grant permission on the basis, on the base, on the information that you have. If the answer is no, we would urge you to reject this, this retrospective application. Thank you very much. Councillor McLean? Yeah, I, I wonder, Chair, I think I need a little bit of legal advice here in that my mother lives in Chase Grove, albeit some distance from this application. But I'm just thinking, should I declare that? It's, it's certainly non, non prejudicial. I, I think you already have declared it, haven't you, Councillor well, yeah, McLean? Have, I think at most it's a personal interest, yes. and it's barely that. It's certainly not, it's not an interest that no. would prevent you from taking it. Okay, that's part. just what I wanted. Just want clarification in case it. Okay, um, do our members have any questions for Helen? Matters of clarification. I, oh, sorry, Councillor Pearson, if I could just, um, I have one, if I may. Um, you say that it's being used as a separate dwelling. Is that by relatives of the main uh, house, do you know, or is it yes. completely different people? So the lady that lives in it, Mrs Farragher, was the person who was originally living in the bungalow and they had all the building works done. And at that point, she told us that, she, that her intention was to live in the garden. So her daughter, Miss Holmes, who's the, the property owner, one who got the mortgage on the property in the first place, could move in with her children. So we knew that they'd bought a property that was not big enough for their family and the intention was to build, but we thought they were gonna convert the garage into a separate bedroom, not build an entire bungalow in their Okay, thank you for that clarification. Councillor Pearson? That was the question. <laughs> that was the obvious question. Thank you very much. I don't think we have any more questions for you, so if you'd like to go back to your seat, thank you. 
do we have Sam Charles here? Yes, Councillor. Councillor Charles from the Parish Council. Thank you. Would you like to put on your microphone? Yeah, I was uh, first called to this property uh, because the, uh, the, one of the neighbours, she cut the neighbour's tree down without permission. Uh, you know, so I got called, there was the first person there. So, uh, as Sheffield Parish Council, uh, we wish to object to this application as follows. It appears that uh, it's been disregarded of the planning process. There has been no opportunity for the Parish Council or the neighbours to object to this application according to the normal planning process. The incidental building was constructed under permitted development rights without any intention of it ever being incidental. There was no genuine compliance with Class E of the permitted development rights household. The outbuilding has never been used as an incidental to the main structure. It was purposely built and had been notified to the enforcement. The development uh, destroys the peaceful enjoyment of the neighbouring properties. The development is contrary to policy restricting back gardens development. The development has no allocation parking. The proposal, if permitted, sets a precedent. If permitted, any windows overlooking neighbours' property should be removed or obscured. If, if permitted, the proposal should remain ancillary to the main house and not to be sold separately. Uh, this person is totally with disregard to any attempt to get, to get planning permission from the beginning. Her words to me was, I do what I want on my own property. Council uh, a contract, uh, contacted the enforcement officer and as far as I know, nothing was done at this early stage. We complained bitterly from the beginning. This household has totally disregarded any neighbours, therefore we ask you as a council not to, to permit the development. I understand the case officer is going to, to recommend that pass if this is the case. You know, why are we wasting our time? We ask the council for your backing in this case, as we have other cases that will come before this committee. I personally think, again, this is planning by the back door. You know, once again, we're seeing it all the time in Shedfield, Walden Chase, as this council. We see it every time they planning by the back door. It's, it's coming on more and more. Thank you. Thank you very <coughs> much, Mr. Uh, Councillor <coughs> Charles. Thank you very much, Councillor Charles, for that. Um, do you members have any um, matters of clarification for Councillor? Thank you. Councillor Pearson. John, you say it was reported to enforcement. First, how long ago? And secondly, did enforcement actually acknowledge receipt? Uh, I believe so. I haven't got that holy information. Uh, but they did go to the property, and I think their argument was they couldn't do anything because it was more or less in the ground, you know, so they couldn't make a judgment on what they were going to do. Thanks, John. Maybe the case officers comment on that. Okay, any other matters of clarification for our parish council representative? Thank you very much indeed for coming along. Just switch off your mic. Thank you. Okay, uh, would you like to update us on anything, Rose, before we come to questions to you? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm not aware of this case. I'm not the actual case officer. Um, however, as I understand it, if the application was reported to the enforcement team and they have looked into it, then it's their call and they have the applicant has submitted an application on the back of that in investigation. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Councillor Reid, have you got a question, please? 
on the whole it's report. It's not a question, Chair, it's a request. Um, due to the nature of this particular structure, I would like to have a slight visit. It is very confined. Certain questions that can say property in situ. So I would therefore propose. Um, okay. Do you have a seconder for that proposal? Right. Yeah, I think I think the problem is. Councillor Reid, that we're only considering the use of the property and not the actual build because it was built under permitted development rights, which is a government policy which allows people to build substantial buildings in their gardens and ancillary to the main dwelling. Um, I'm not sure of that. Jim, I think what we're here for, because it's a planning application for the conversion of and that is the bit that I would like to see since because as a livable different ancillary. It is the Chair, same the thing. Is I, yeah, I understand that. I'm just I'm not I'm not I'm not Councillor Lane, did you have a comment? Yeah, I mean if we're looking at this as permitted development. That's one thing because it's, an, it's part of the house. This is a separate dwelling. So can we have a clarification on the difference between ancillary and a separate dwelling? Because that is the crux of this problem, as far as I can see. It also shared the question of change of use. Thank you. According to the plans, it's an office space. Yes, well, the change of use is what is what this application. Yeah. Yeah. Legal advice. Chair, the application isn't for a separate dwelling, it is for an annex and the condition that's suggested ensures that the, the unit of accommodation is used um, for ancillary purposes, i.e. by family members or guests only, which is what prevents it from being a separate dwelling used by completely unrelated members of the public. So that's what you're dealing with. Councillor McLean. Thank you, Chair. But it is still a dwelling, is it? Legally or otherwise, it's somewhere somebody lives in it, therefore they dwell in it. Well, it, it is accommodation, yeah. but, it, but it's not a single dwelling house. It's yeah, not regarded as a office, single dwelling it? house because yeah, it has a condition which prevents it from being occupied by a, anybody at large. Yeah, but it's not an office, though, is it anymore? No, We're now clearly looking not. As a dwelling, so it's, it's accommodation, yeah. yes. Yeah, thank you. Which is why this, I supported this come under the um, Gibson and Traveller Bill? Are you, are you arguing the same argument to do with uh, Gypsy and Traveller sites, that each pitch can have an ancillary building, which is not necessarily, lands up not necessarily what, which sounds exactly the same as this. Are we talking about the same planning law? No, it's nothing to do with Gypsies and Travellers, although I would actually point that as a matter of law, anybody can put a caravan in their back garden, which can be occupied by a family member, and that doesn't require planning permission. Um, so it, it's not unusual for people to accommodate members of their family in their back garden in various types of accommodation. OK, I think we're getting into debate rather than uh, questions. And um, we do have a proposal before us for a site visit. So is there any debate around this proposal for a site visit? I myself do not think it will help the discussion, but... Um, I'm, I'm happy to have a vote on it. Mr Chairman, but in the light of what we've just been told by a legal officer, I, I see limited points. I mean, it's, uh, it's, the building is there. It's a question of what conditions we put on the future use of it. I mean, exactly. Okay. I mean, Thank I you very much. I think back in that situation, Denmead, where I refused to vote, almost similar permitted developments, which are, if this was built as an outbuilding, building regs, by application, there's a whole gamut of things should have been involved, which clearly haven't been. This does worry me, but, but it wouldn't clarify that. We had a similar one of these in Colton Common, if you remember. It got turned over at appeal. We threw it, it out. It did. It got turned over at appeal. Yeah, it, was, it came to this committee at least three times. That's, yeah, okay, we all have experience of these things. Okay, Councillor Clear. 
Thank you, Chair. I was just going to come down to, uh, I think it's the status of use, and I don't think, uh, I agree with Councillor Pearson, that a site visit would really do very much there, but it's the status of use. You're not having paying visitors there, and um, in legal terms, I think that's the main issue, really. Okay, having had that, oh, Councillor don't look exasperated, Chair. I've got a reasonable question to ask. Carry on then. Thank you. Um, is it reasonable to condition this against, at some point in the future, being used as a, what do you call it really, what they call an Airbnb type situation? Is that a reasonable condition to place? Because I, you know, I can see at some point in the future. I understand. Well Thank you, Councillor Clay. That's a perfectly legitimate question um, for... for <laughs> It's a fairly legitimate question when we get into talking about the actual application rather than the site visit. But nevertheless, I do believe, and I've looked into this carefully and spoken to officers about this, that the existing condition in the application covers that, that it will not be um, um, used by anybody uh, except persons of the same household or their guests. And guests does not include paying guests. Um, I don't know whether we could enforce that condition in some other way, but let's let's move to the site visit, okay? I, I want to have a vote on whether or not to have a site visit. So can I see those in favour of Councillor Reeves? Chairman, point Chair. of order, if I may. I don't look so depressed. As the second has dropped out, it's no longer. Okay, we have Councillor McLean who stepped in as a seconder. So can I see all those in favour of a site visit? Two. Those against. Those against. Okay, we carry on with the discussion. Thank you very much. We are at questions to our officer. So I will take questions on the whole report to Rose. Uh, I think we have covered quite a lot of issues already. Uh, Councillor Reid. Thank you, Chair. Um, based on that, um, the amenity area has not been identified. So this is going to be shared amenity areas, both properties. You, you know, when you look at it, it is a single property. It has one of everything, a bedroom, a lounge, and a kitchen. Does it require amenity? Thank you for and that question, parking. Rose. Rose? Parking as well. yeah. um, so in this case, the amenity is shared as it's an annex to the existing dwelling. It's not the creation of a new planning unit. It's acceptable to have a shared amenity space. Um, if it was a new um, planning unit, then we would consider having an additional amenity space. But in this case, that's not being um, in regards to the parking, um, my colleague has assessed this and has agreed that there is sufficient parking to meet the residential parking. I believe so, yes. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Laming. Thank you. As this is um, a change of use to a dwelling, how does this affect by our phosphate um, legislation that's coming up? It's, because it's an ancillary use, it's uh, not material, the phosphates. If we were considering a separate planning unit for a new dwelling, then it would be a material consideration. Um, I find that rather strange that you're allowing that to happen because, you know, there's a, quite a strong thing on the environment, that and nitrates. And we need to take some consideration of that and the change of use. Surely this should be taken into account of whether we allow the change of use. Annex. We, we look at phosphates and um, nit nitrates for overnight accommodation, but it does need to be associated with a sort of a, a new use in itself. And this isn't, it's part of the existing household. It's just like an extension, basically. It's just that it's not attached. That's how we're considering this. Yeah, I'm sorry, no results push this point, but it is changed from a day use to a 24-hour use, which is a totally different thing. Um, and it didn't have a kitchen before, 
um, and it didn't have a bathroom before. So I think we need to uh, actually look at that closely. I think I think that point's been covered, Councillor. Come to that in debate. Any more questions for our planning officer, please, on the report? We're looking at the report, the entire report, including the conditions. Thank you, Councillor Pearson. Uh, similar to Councillor Leming, as uh, Deborah, uh, it sounds as though we can't do anything about removing this building. Uh, so it's a question of making sure the specifications are up to what we would expect uh, an ancillary building to be. Now, if it is indeed ancillary, it has its own um, sewage system, but does it? Uh, you're very bland with your comments about sustainable drainage. So what sort of sustainable uh, drainage is actually in place? And uh, how does this link to uh, Southern Water which is the local foul water drainage system, or is there a cesspit? Exactly how is this dealt with? Thank you. Um, as I understand it, the um, drainage has been connected to the existing for the main dwelling, so it's all connected to the existing on the site. Is it acceptable? Uh, if I may say, does that all supply with the, uh, to the other utilities? Are they linked through the main bungalow? As I understand it, yes, that's it. Well, if, if it's an annex, or granny annex, for example, that's got to be separate from the main building. But does it have its own meter system? Um, is it all electric? Does it have gas central heating? Uh, the things you expect to have in a normal annex, separate from the main building. It's not necessarily a planning consideration to look at the utility, but expect something that was in the curtilage of an existing to be providing for those utilities in the same way and the provisions that are <coughs> that are there. Um, there's a it will need building regulations for the drainage. Um, page 90 of the report does it, it does it does set that out as well, and that there aren't any concerns about that. So we're not looking at this like a separate dwelling where we would look at that in more detail. Are you suggesting that where we pass? a building that might be unsuitable for a, a human habitation? We're looking at the land use for it. I think the specifics of, you know, electricity, they're not material considerations. We never make those assessments. Thank you very much. Councillor McLean. Thank you, Chair. Um, building regs, following on Councillor Pearson's, just digging a little bit deeper on this. Um, we recently had an application come before us building a if you like an, a, um, a utility on the side of our house and we have to build it to building reg standards were building reg standard adhered to in the building of this office space that is now converting into a dwelling as an office maybe it didn't have to conform but as a dwelling possibly it does have to conform to building reg. it's livable accommodation so it will need a building regs for application but i can't comment any further on that because it is a building regulations matter so we're being asked to approve the application before we know if building regs are going in to look at the building. Is that right? Is that what you're saying? It's not a material consideration, though. We have multiple applications and we don't wait first. Building regulations often appreciate this is retrospective, but in my opinion, that's just not a material consideration. You know, again, you know, with respect, we, we've had um, one of the speakers say that the foundations were substandard. Okay, not a bit, not a building inspector, but the, these foundations were substandard. And it's built of breeze block. We don't know if it's double or single skinned. A whole load of stuff that we don't know because it wasn't built standard. Okay, Councillor McLean, thank you very much. Do we report, may I ask, do we report these buildings to the buildings regulation officers? Um, well, just bear in mind that um, many building regulations are enforced by external um, building control officers. So, though the council provides a service, it's um, you know marketplace service. It could be provided by an external provider. And I would just also add, in relation to Councillor McLean's query, is that um, the construction of the build and building regulation compliance or absence of is not a reason that you could give for refusing this application. 
Indeed, it's not a material planning consideration. Councillor Laming. Yeah, we, he we heard from the objector that overlooking problems. Are we going to put any conditions in if we have to agree on this? And secondly, um, the dark skies policy that we have, this is not that far from the National Park. Are we going to put any conditions on for external lighting? I mean, so. I just thought it's worthwhile if we just look at the position of the windows to see if there's anything relevant to see if we need to ensure an obscure glazing of anything. Just outline where the where the existing windows are and what they look out to. So the existing windows, there are two in the lounge that face the existing dwelling as well as a pair of French um, doors. On the other side at the kitchen, we have one window facing the rear and one facing the um, neighbour on the other side. There is one window in the bathroom on this side and internally facing <coughs> there is a window facing the hallway and a window in the bedroom facing the amenity space as well. So here you can see French doors and the two windows in the living room, the hallway window and the bedroom window. Yes, but I was asking about overlooking roads. That's the bit that concerns me. Um, so at the rear, you can just see there is a window here that faces the, the hedge. This would be the kitchen window to the rear. This one. So the, you can just see the window frame there that faces the neighbour's hedge, which serves the kitchen. Okay, do we consider that there are overlooking issues here? Back towards the house and the ground floor. Ownership of the ownership of the hedgerows. I don't have that information, I'm afraid. It's normally part owned with the boundary line running through the middle, that's sort of standard practice. We could put a condition on to, for that rear um, kitchen and bathroom um, window because it's otherwise it's reliant on that hedge remaining at that height and then there is a possibility that that might not be in, in, remain in the future. So there would be no harm if we wanted to ensure obscure glazing of those adjoining windows that face the neighbour. Although you saw from the previous photographs at the moment, they can only really see the, the gutter line. So they don't tower up a boat over it, but it would sure in perpetuity that if that hedge failed, that those windows wouldn't then overlook. OK, would we like to put in that extra condition on those... Uh, windows at the back of the property. Yes? yes. Okay, thank you. Sure. Let's... Could that also cover the side window? I think Which I think that equally... would be sensible. So I think all all the windows that are looking out to external. external not looking internally into the garden could be obscured. Yeah, no, not all of those. Not the ones that face outwards rather than inwards. Is that agreed by members to add that extra condition? Yes. Yes. yes, thank you. Okay, any more questions for our officer? Otherwise, we'll move into debate. Debate. Councillor Pearson. Well, I'll be quite frank with you. I don't like this application at all. Um, it's, it's a nightmare scenario, similar to the one we had in Colden Common and then later on in Denmead, where... My gut feeling says it's a wrong one, or the planning inspector disagreed eventually, holds in common. I'm already afraid the same thing would happen here. Design point of view is completely alien to that area. Um, 
it looks to me like two containers being put on site and then faced with uh, breeze blocks. I've got no evidence to say that. I'm simply saying that's what it looks like to me. Um, I'm concerned about the change of use. Originally, it was designed as an outbuilding. Well, farmers have outbuildings that generally keep cattle. But occasionally, seaside, they'd keep pigs in there. Although this is, I'm not saying that this is designed for that, but that's what the meaning of outbuilding means. Now we suddenly find it's not just an outbuilding, it's going to become an annex. Um, in which case, I agree entirely with what the parish council has said, and that is, if this committee is minded to pass this, quite whatever I might say, the people, obviously the committee has their own opinions, it has to be laid down quite clearly. This can only be, I, and I don't think the condition is strong enough, this can only be as a, a, a granny annex for family members. I, I would even exclude guests, quite frankly, because that granny annex don't usually include guests. This applicant has done their best to avoid the normal planning routine, exactly as the parish council says. Um, and I fully agree with them. And we're setting here a precedent where people, if they're so minded, can move forward, do a development, hide anything regarding footings, anything normally at building regulation cover, hide it, and then even though it's reported to enforcement and all that would do would delay the building of it, but it doesn't do anything about removing it, our experiences, although when I first joined this council, remember we had a case in uh, Soberton where the enforcement meant a building had to be pulled down because it was one foot out of place. But that doesn't apply now. Uh, so we're stymied by events, which may be changed in the NPPF, but frankly, to me, it's a wrong one. I will vote, but I, re um, I agree fully exactly what, um, what's it, who wrote this report? Megan, was it? Uh, well, you're the surrogate anyway, Rose. <laughs> um, it, it says what it is, but I don't know my experience says it's a wrong one, but Thank nothing you. I can do about it. Thank you, Councillor Pearson. Any further debate? Councillor Laming. I dislike this application. I don't think it conforms to the normal requirements of this committee or our planning policies. I don't think it conforms to our environmental policies, uh, asking for a code four, which is the government minimum. Um, and I think it's a, not a very good development. I think it's over, it's over development of the site. Therefore, I don't see how I can really support this. Councillor McLean. Thank you, Chair. I've um, been, been listening to this and listening to what's been said here. Um, if we approve this, we send out a message to the larger villages, I think it's mentioned in our policies, um, to the market towns and to the central Winchester, that if somebody puts up something, they can then come along later and turn it into something else, i.e. a dwelling, which we've discussed. Um, so I'm looking at policy MTRA well, three and four, I suppose, and I've, I've just been looking at the report and I can't find if they have a bearing on this application. Um, if this was in the countryside, policy MTRA certainly four would kick in and stop it being developed. So it's a rural village. And yet we don't even seem to have considered the effects of MTRA4 on, um, on what we're doing here and what's being done. Now, that scares the heck out of me because it's one of the major policies we use to baseball bat anybody who is trying to develop something in the countryside. Here we are. This is being effectively looks as if it's being, um, well, it is, it's being put forward acceptance, which I can't see it. Sorry, MTRA4 to me says it shouldn't be happening. Thank you, Councillor McLean. Any further debate? Councillor Clear. Thank you, Chair. May I first say that I completely agree with Councillor Pearson. This to me is completely 
wrong what's happened, but we do. We are going to put a condition on with the windows, I hope. Um, I can't, and like Councillor McLean, though, I'm not sure what policy I can bring up to object. I'm very saddened by it, but, and it is wrong, but I don't see how I can go against it because I can't come up with the correct solution. Thank you, Councillor Clear. Um, I will contribution now. So the problem here is permitted development rights. We have a government that has allowed permitted development rights, in my view, to get out of hand. And it's allowing people to build these very large, very large uh, ancillary buildings in the gardens without proper oversight by planning authorities. I hope that, um, that, that things will change in the future, but at the moment this is allowed and therefore those buildings have now been converted into an annex, which is what is before us now, an annex. We have very strong conditions on page 93, which cover the annex accommodation, and it also says there shall be no subdivision of this single residential planning unit, and the unit shall at no time be let or sold, let or sold as an independent unit of accommodation. So it, the, the, the plans that we are agreeing insist that it should be an ancillary dwelling to the main house and permanently only used by members of the family or their guests. Um, so that is how it's happened. I'm afraid there are no material planning reasons, in my view, that we could put forward um, to, to pose this in planning reasons. And that's not to say that I don't have complete sympathy with the name. We've done what we can um, by the addition of another condition to make all the windows that look out into other gardens obscure windows um, and the other issues parking um, overlooking so on have been covered by the officer parking has been deemed to be at the minimum level available so that's no, no reason to object either so i i agree with councillor pearson it's a shame we have to approve this there is no planning reason that we can put forward um, so, Councillor Clear, you have an additional contribution. To yeah, I do wonder, Chair, that in the recommendation to about the annex, can we say and shall be occupied only by persons of the same household and cut out all their guests? Is that possible, please? I don't think that that would be a reasonable condition because people do have visitors. Do have visitors, and uh, it wouldn't be. We have to be reasonable in our conditions. Am I right there? We do. We could we could tighten up the wording when it says guests, but it wouldn't be reasonable to say that nobody has a friend or a family member as a guest who doesn't normally dwell in the main house can't stay there. So that wouldn't be reasonable. But we could perhaps say non-paying guests, so it's clear they're not. It's not let out or. Uh, because it needs to be friends, otherwise I don't consider that's reasonable for a friend to stay the night. Let, let's add in non-paying. That's reasonable. Councillor McLean. Makes it more precise. Councillor McLean. Thank you, Chair. You were sounding a bit exasperated again there. Um, <clears throat> you say you can't find, and you've been advising us that you can't find a policy reason going against this application. But I quoted a second or two ago MTRA 4, which if you've got your policy documents in front of you, you might like to read it um, because it talks about, in my opinion, um, expansion or redevelopment of existing buildings as one. It talks about uh, where are we? Development, uh, small scale sites of low tourist accommodation appropriate. That slips in. And yet, I think it would, um, it would. Certainly from my point of view, it gives me a reason to object to the application. That's all I'm going to say, but maybe MTRA 4 is a consideration. Thank you, Councillor McLean. Uh, perhaps we could ask our legal and uh, planning advisors here what they consider about that uh, suggestion. 
the uh, it's in a defined settlement boundary of Waltham Chase, so it's MTRA two which which defines those settlements. So MTRA four is is not a relevant policy because that's for all areas outside of the main settlements. So I'm trying to find the policy map to to, to clarify that on to show you. Um, but it's certainly not cited in the report MTRA4, which would only be relevant to new dwelling uses anyway, not for ancillary buildings, even if it was in the countryside. Thank you very much, Mr. Sanchez. Councillor Pearson, do you want to put on your microphone? Sorry, yes. Uh, other you, yourselves quote page 87, high quality design, in my opinion, it isn't. Uh, no recognition of any sort of biodiversity, uh, design criteria, well, if that's high quality design, um, then um, access and parking, D which is DM18. These are all negative things, um, but it depends which bullet point to use in each of these. And we've come across this time and time again. Um, policies are grey, and by the case officer opinion, uh, it's late enough to go through. Um, as I say, I mean, this is, you know, leads towards a very, very reluctant decision, but unfortunately it's going to send the wrong signals. Yes, well, we are a planning committee and we have to deal with the planning rules that we have and the uh, policies that we have. And uh, my understanding is that there isn't a planning policy that we could stand in front of an inspector that would, would stand consideration that would turn this down. So that's why I will be supporting the officer's recommendation. But let's go to the vote, shall we? Unless there's any more debate? No? Okay, so can I see all those? In? This is recommended for approval. We have additional conditions that the windows looking outside of the site will be gla uh, obscure glazed. We have an additional um, word um, to on page 93 to condition number two, which would be um, occupied only by persons of the same household or their. Um, okay. Are we all clear what we're voting on? So, can I see all those in favour of the officer recommendation, please? Four. And those against? I'm afraid I'm going to have to use my chair's casting vote very reluctantly indeed and uh, vote again the way I voted just a minute ago and uh, approve this on the basis I don't think it would get past the minute. Thank you very much everybody. Um, that is approved with those very strict conditions attached to it and I hope that the owner will of those. I think that's it. Oh no, we've got a tree protection order, haven't we? Okay, so uh, a Chair, short just... pause whilst we wait for our tree officer to arrive. Chair, can I ask a question? Knowing what has been reported of this particular applicant, um, and building regs being what it is these days, how do we ever know that this ever receives any attention at building rate. Right? Yeah, but at the end of the day, it could equally not be proper. Yeah, no. I mean, the enforcement authority, as I understand it, would still be our own building um, control team. So that's where any enforcement activity or investigation would come from. They might ask to see the... Just looking at the action this particular applicant has already taken, are they going to be bothered to go to building rates? That's the bit that worries me. To bit. be honest, I'm not sure generally how. Um... Okay, I will ask officers to look into that. Yeah, with respect, sure. Chair, it's you know it is pointless because we've already been told enforcement have, have been out to look at it and found it to be perfectly okay. So why would building rates go out? Well, if enforcement have looked at it, they must have building regs approval. Not necessarily. Okay, officers will look into this. If necessary, that will be raised with the relevant authority. It is not a material planning consideration, so it could not have come into our decision in any event. 
So let's move on to um, agenda item 11, which is a tree protection order 2309, land at the Gorse 111 Main Road, Colden Common. And our presenting officer is John Bartlett. Thank you, John. Thank you, Chair, uh, and good afternoon. Good afternoon, councillors. Um, so I'm here to uh, request the confirmation of TPO 2309 with uh, modification. Uh, to give you some background to the case, uh, the time the TPO was served, the council received one uh, letter of objection. Um, in terms of uh, what led us to make this TPO, we received information of a credible threat to uh, two, oak, two oak trees on the property, um, but it, there was also uh, the threat of um, clearance of basically the whole site, but these were seen as um, valuable trees in the outset. We made a, a temporary assessment and the, the trees were deemed worthy of protection at the time. However, on carrying out a further, more detailed inspection, T1 was found to be unsuitable for protection. Uh, so, uh, on confirmation of this TPO, it's proposed that T1 is removed from the, the TPO and T2 uh, stays on the TPO. In terms of the objections that we received, um, one of the first one was that the CPO mentions two trees, one of which one of which is not on the property owner's land, uh, and also that a large number of trees were removed in a neighbour's property to make way for development. Uh, so, just to address T1 again, um, so once we made a more detailed assessment, it was noted that the this oak tree was actually just located on a, on a neighbouring property. That wasn't clear from the initial site assessment from the road, um, but it, we put the TPO in place as a precautionary measure because both the oak trees were highly visible to the public. Um, on that same tree, it was noted that uh, a limb had historically been cut off and this affected the tree's stability and makes it uh, far more um, open to decay pathogen so and it also had a, a notable decline so it wasn't seen as suitable to um, keep, keep the tree on the on the TPO. In terms of the issue of the trees being removed from a neighbouring property this is not relevant to deciding whether or not this TPO should be confirmed uh, and the map there shows uh, T2 uh, which we want to keep on TPO and T1, uh, which we're looking to uh, remove from the TPO on, on confirmation. Uh, first view here is from Sandy Fields Lane, um, quite highly visible to the public uh, there from, from that view. A big mature oak tree, um, high amenity value, and uh, a, a highly valuable in terms of biodiversity with the hundreds of species uh, that it supports. Uh, this is from outside 109-111 Main Road, uh, another uh, good view of the tree. The, the other tree that we want to take off slightly to the right and slightly covered there, um, but uh, T2 is, is that bit more valuable as well. And this is outside the caravan park slightly uh, down from 111 on main road there and another view there um, this is uh, from out from outside 111 in terms of government guidelines it may be expedient to make a tpo if the authority believes that there is a risk of trees being felled pruned or damaged in ways which would have a significant impact on the amenity of the area. 
is not necessary for there to be an immediate risk for there to be a need to protect the trees. In this case, there was strong information that there was an immediate threat to these trees, to this particular tree as well. In some cases, the authority may believe that certain trees are at risk as a result of development pressures, and they may consider where they're in the interest of immunity that is expedient to make an order. Authorities can also consider other sources of risks to trees with significant immunity value, for example, changes to property ownership and intentions to fell trees are not always known in advance. So it may sometimes be appropriate to proactively make orders as a precaution. Um, and we put the TPO on both oak trees as a precaution initially at the time. And so our recommendation is to confirm TPO 2309 with modification to remove T1 from the TPO. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, we have no public speaking, so are there any questions for our officer? Councillor Clear. Thank you, Chair. John, just for clarification, may I ask, um, T1 Oak did have a TPO on it. And then it was noted that a major limb was cut off. Who who did that, John? And did we not take issue with that? I just want to get it clear in my mind. Yeah, so the, the limb that was historically lost was before the TPO was made. So, yeah, quite a time ago. But, um... Councillor Pearson? Well, it's a continuation of what Councillor Clare has just asked. Um, Thinking of a case down, as I think it was down in Cornwall, where somebody removed a row of trees because it blocked his view. Here we've got somebody who wants to remove a tree, T1, because of further development. Do we have any recourse about the uh, damage and loss of this tree? I, I agree 100%, valuable amenity, oak trees particularly. Do we, ha do we have any comeback about this at all? Uh, well, this this particular tree, as it had lost quite a substantial limb, um, it's, it's it's not deemed worthy to be protected because this it, the tree is in decline as well. There's major dieback in the crown, and it'd be open to decay, so it wouldn't be suitable to protect this tree because it hasn't got a retention span which is as long. So what I'm saying, John, is do we have any comeback? lost this tree even though it didn't have a TPO. Lost the tree because of damage created by somebody on the case in the past. Well, that could have been a developer. We just don't know. All yeah. we can do is speculate. Um, well, it's, yeah, we, yeah, it, it's quite um, possible that we could uh, investigate that further but it's the, the the tree itself yeah obviously it's it's in decline in decline now but um yeah that what i'm it, saying is that can we ask them to replace it uh well the thing is could the, the tree wasn't subject to a tpo in the first place so in a way they yeah they wouldn't be, would have been minded to yeah yeah Okay, thank you. I think that's clear. Any other questions? No? Debate? No? Okay. Uh, can I see this? So this application for a con to confirm TVO 2309 just on tree T2, not T1, which is now off this application. So can I see all those in favour of this um, tree? members lovely so that is confirmed thank you very much and that is the end of today's planning committee thank you very much everybody